this is the technology in the future of medicine course. So of course you've probably heard about nanotechnology, you've probably heard about um, micro machining and stuff like that. So just to give you an idea, this battery is a 1300 milliamp hour lithium polymer battery. So it's very sensitive um, to changes in voltage, but it packs a lot of punch. So if you take 1.3 amps times 11.1 volts, um, you're getting something close to 25 watt hours of power in here. And it can burn it in about six minutes. So if you do the conversion, you're talking about a max peak power of about 150 watts that comes out of this thing. So one of the enabling technologies of these things is that miniaturization has shrunk the transmitter, the receiver, um, the cameras, everything about this thing. So if you look closely on the bottom, there's a couple of components that I can point out to you. So there's this white board that's kind of hidden in all these wires. And that's the flight controller, it's the brains. And this is one of those enabling technologies. So on this board, you've got an Atmega 2650, uh, which is a microcontroller. So it's basically a little mini computer that is following instructions in real time. And that's what's calculating how fast to spin each rotor. So these things all balance each, each other out. I've got two props that rotate counterclockwise and two that rotate clockwise. And that's to balance out the angular momentum. When it pivots, Okay, it's spinning up the clockwise motors and spinning down the counterclockwise. So if you spin the clockwise, it'll actually rotate counterclockwise. If you spin the counterclockwise, it'll rotate clockwise. So it's all a balance of the physics involved in this. And it's also keeping that um, stable in the air. So if it's, if it's rotating, it's also powering up, um, powering down these motors and powering these ones up to balance the vertical motion as well. To move forward, it powers up the back ones, back, left and right. So you have the full range of motion and it's actually being calculated on board. When you're talking about regular remote control airplanes, they've got the receiver that communicates with the transmitter and typically you just plug the control surfaces in. So elevator, rudder, ailerons. Whereas this one, you plug the, the receiver into this flight controller and then it sends these commands out to the speed controls. So it's all happening on the board in real time. And there's another chip on here that's really important called the 6050. And it's got the gyroscopes and the accelerometers that tell it what's down and what direction it's moving in. So it knows it has real-time feedback uh, in flight. Now, some of the students that came a little bit early got to have a first-person view through the, the two cameras here. So this is actually a stereoscopic camera and a stereoscopic transmitter. So there's um, two antennas for each of the two cameras, and then my receiver does the same thing. So you're not only seeing the first person view from the quadcopter, you're also seeing the stereoscopic vision from that. So you get depth of field and all sorts of other information. Now this is a little racing quadcopter, and that's why I chose this stereoscopic camera. But this was only available on January 12th. And I was just happened to be in the market at the time and saw this pop up as a pre-order, and I was like, that's it, 500 bucks. It's twice as good as the equivalent package, right? I was pricing everything out. $530 would buy me one of these, one of these, and one receiver, and I wouldn't get the stereo vision. But, you know, come January, this came out, $530, same price, dual redundancy, and this has all sorts of extra features too. Um, it's got a DVR built in. You can get um, the audiovisual out, so if I wanted to, I could plug this into the projector, and while I'm flying it, you could see it on the screen. So there's all sorts of options that weren't available last year that are available this year. So this is just kind of one small example of the, the rate of acceleration. These things have finally gotten small enough that including two for the price of one is feasible. So I don't know, next year, everybody's gonna have two cameras in their systems, right? These guys are, are leaders on the forefront. Now you see, I did have a little collision here, so I've got some fracturing on the propeller, which means that it's maybe not so safe to fly it anymore. But I've got some spares um, if need be, and after the class, I'll do another little uh, video tour. So that being said, um, the topic today is going to be, there's still plenty of room at the bottom. It's kind of a materials look at computing and how that's progressed since you know, the early days. So why don't we get started with that? Normally I'd be wearing the same t-shirt as in the picture here, and it'll become clear why. I just, I forgot. I didn't wear my t-shirt today. But nonetheless, the t-shirt the in this picture is important, and also the person that's wearing it is important. Um, Richard Feynman is the person who said, there's plenty of room at the bottom, and the topic today is going to be building upon his lecture from the 1950s, and we just added the word still. So foundations of the nanotechnology revolution. And 
I'm a student here, or I was a student here as of two weeks ago. I am Dr. Ross Lockwood, so I just recently graduated uh, from physics. Thank you. And today, we're going to be talking about this man, Richard Feynman. So, Richard Feynman, born in 1918 in New York, and attended the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. So really had kind of an ideal um, young life, but that was cut short by World War II, where he actually worked on the Manhattan Project. And this is the project that de helped develop the nuclear bombs that were um, dropped during World War II. And he worked with famous scientists like Hans Bethe and uh, Neil Bohr and Robert Oppenheimer. And he led a group called a computation group. Now at the time, there were no computers as we know them today. Computers back then were people who were doing calculations by hand. So he was managing a group of people who were doing these calculations by hand, ensuring that their calculations were correct and done quickly, and, uh, and they produced results for the yield of these nuclear bombs. So before there was a bomb, they needed to calculate how big the blast would be. You know, you wouldn't want to set off a bomb if you didn't know what the safe range was to set it off from. So he was responsible for those calculations. And he actually witnessed the first atomic bomb test with his naked eye. Unlike everybody else that witnessed the first atomic bomb test, they were all given uh, basically the equivalent of welder's glass to protect their eyes. But he was a physicist. He knew that uh, glass absorbed strongly in the UV. So rather than wear this special glass that everybody had prepared, he just looked through the windshield of his truck, saw the visible light from the nuclear bomb, and was the first person on Earth to do so. He's also famous because he won the Nobel Prize. So he's got this convoluted history of, uh, of, of accomplishments, but he won the Nobel Prize uh, for actually his work on quantum electrodynamics in 1965, which is a little bit unrelated to what we're talking about today. But nonetheless, uh, Nobel Prize winner, and another thing you may, have, you may know him for is his um, input in the ch 1986 Challenger explosion. So he was on the Joint Committee, they did the research, he discovered that the O-rings being used were brittle at the temperatures they were trying to launch the rocket at. Something that he thought was a huge oversight, and, uh, and he basically chastised NASA for their inability to operate within their own parameters. So for a su successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. So that just means that we're limited by the laws of nature, not by the laws of man. Although we do follow the laws of man when it comes to um, developing new technologies for ethical concerns, for other concerns, for safety concerns above all else. But if you want to learn more about Feynman the person, the, the place to look that up is in his autobiography, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. This is a very interesting read, very interesting person, and I highly recommend it. Uh, he, he does have physics textbooks, so you may see them if you go to the bookstore. He's got the Feynman fix, uh, phys, uh, the Feynman Lectures on Physics, which are a great supplement if you wanted to learn um, some physics. But what we are here to talk about today is basically the beginning of the nanotechnology re revolution. And really the consensus is that it all started back in 1959 when Feynman gave his famous lecture called There's Plenty of Room at the, at the Bottom. And basically what he did was he, he put forth the idea that eventually humans will be manipulating individual atoms and in doing so, they fundamentally change the way that we interact with nature. That we'll be able to store libraries on grains of sand and particles of dust. And we'll be able to do calculations in the same, same volumes as well. So just to give you an idea, he, he gave this talk in 1959. Okay? He worked on the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. And just to give you an idea, in terms of what technology was available at the time, in 1939, the first electron, uh, electron microscope was introduced. This is the first technology that lets you have uh, magnification of objects beyond, what's cap uh, beyond the capability of visible light. So we're talking about more than 10,000 times magnification. In fact, STMs today can see individual atoms and can even see some of their electronic properties. In 1957, just two years before um, this talk was given, Sputnik was launched, okay? And 10 years before the first germanium transistor was, was demonstrated, and following that in 1954, the first silicon transistor was, was demonstrated. So these are components that are fundamental to computation, but 
they're basically in their infancy, right? They're still doing calculations based on vacuum tube technologies. And in the same year he gave this talk, Texas Instruments commercialized the first integrated electronic circuit. So we're really talking about not only the, the birth of nanotechnology, but basically the birth of electronics as we know it today. Now, this is uh, one of the famous computers of the era. So ENIAC was completed in 1946. It was actually devised to compute artillery tables for the military, but because World War II ended shortly um, before ENIAC came online, it ended up working towards uh, yield calculations for the first hydrogen bombs. So ENIAC is, is famous. It had almost 18,000 vacuum tubes as its switching components, and it had a really huge footprint, 167 meters. So if you take maybe the length of this room as, uh, let's say, 15 meters, double the length, and, and think of a, a, just a regular server rack. So double the length and server racks twice the length of this, or maybe just you know, two rows of server racks in this room. That's how big ENIAC was. And this will become important when we talk about miniaturization a little later on. But let's hear it in Feynman's own words. So I'll read this aloud, and then we're going to watch a short clip of Feynman giving uh, a lecture on this topic. So this is what he said in 1959. As soon as I mention this, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it has progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the na nail on your small finger. And there's a device on the market, they tell me, by which you can print the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. But that's nothing. That's the most primitive halting step in the direction that I intend to discuss. And it is staggeringly small world that is below. In the year 2000, 40 years before this is... Um, 40, 40 years before the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it was not until the 1960s that anybody began seriously to move in this direction. Now, in retrospect, we're past the year 2000. I don't really see this as um, such a problem. I don't think that they should have tried this stuff before the year 1960. But that being said, in Richard Feynman's own words, he thinks it was it was too late, that they, that they should have been working on this a lot sooner. Nonetheless, here we are today, plenty of atomic scale nanotechnology going on. In fact, we're sitting here beside Canada's best nanotechnology facility, the National Institute for Nanotechnology, and I'll talk a little about that later. So just to put that into context, that's 1984, that picture of the, of the microchip that he was talking about up there. So he had, again, 30, 30 years of experience to build off of his original lecture, or, well, a little less than 30. Uh, so he was talking about how do you make things small? How do you make them, you know, how do you digitize information on a small scale? And just to give you an idea, does anybody know how big um, the English language Wikipedia indexes that includes the pictures. I think it's about 40 gigabytes. I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing that it's around 40 gigabytes for the entire English language Wikipedia. You can look it up. You've got computers sitting in front of you. But now imagine you go to a store and you want to you get 40 gigabytes worth of storage. What's the smallest thing you can buy that, that has that capacity? Today it's a micro SD card, right? If you just go to, you know, London Drugs, Future Shop, you can get micro SD cards as, as big as 128 gigabytes, and the 256 are coming out shortly if they haven't come out already. But we can fit what Feynman was talking about, but a richer version, C comparing it, Wikipedia to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and then saying, well, we can fit the entire Wikipedia database on something the size of your fingernail. That's what he was talking about. How do you get all that information down to that size? Well, we're using flash memory and all sorts of things that he's not talking about. He's talking about writing them atom by atom or patches of atoms by patches of atoms. So you can actually do better than a micro SD card if you consider doing it the way that he's talking about. And for the time being, let's just stay with two-dimensional objects. He did mention that if you use the volume of the head of a pin, that you get you know, a, a, a cubic increase in the amount of data that you can actually store uh, in that volume. So just to recap what he said here, I've estimated how many letters there are in the encyclopedia and assume that each of my 24 million books as big as an encyclopedia volume 
So 24 million books on the planet, I think, is what he's talking about. That there are 10 to the 15 bits, and for each bit, he's allowing 100 atoms, which is a lot of atoms. We can manipulate hundreds of atoms quite easily today. As it turns out, all the information that man has carefully accumulated in the books of the world can be written in this form, a cube, a cube one two hundredth of an inch wide, which is the barest piece of dust that you can see with the human eye. So there's plenty of room at the bottom. Don't tell him about microfilm. All right. Now, in 1959, when he gave this original lecture, he came up with two challenges. He wanted to see, one, a working electric motor that was one sixty-fourth of an inch on a side that was controllable from the outside. And he wanted to see a page of written text in an area one twenty-five thousandth smaller in linear scale. And it was only the, the next year, he offered up $1,000 for each of these. It was the next year that the first challenge was met. William McClellan in 1960 created a motor that was less than a 64th of an inch on a side. Unfortunately, it was really frustrating for Feynman because he didn't use any new techniques to create this motor. He basically used you know, standard machining techniques to produce this. And it was actually the year after Feynman gave the lecture we just saw that the second challenge was met. And it was Tom Newin in 1985 that, as a graduate student, used an electron beam in the mode that Feynman was suggesting, that you're using an electron microscope backwards. You're actually writing with the beam to, to rewrite the first page of Charles Dickens' a, a Tale of Two Cities. So we've come a long way since 1985. We're, we're 30 years out now. So now let's talk about what's happened in the intervening time. And it actually, let's keep, keep on track with Feynman here. So in the 1980s, we were talking about computer architecture and all the different ways you could do it. And one way that they proposed was to do this multi-dimensional architecture called the connection machine. And Feynman actually worked on this project in the last years of his life. So you know, he bounced from atomic bombs to nanoscale stuff to quantum electrodynamics. His whole life was just a series of really interesting projects. And he engaged with Danny Hills uh, to work on a thesis project. Now, the connection machine designed by Danny was uh, a computer with a million processors. It was envisioned to have a million processors, each connected to one another with a line of communication. And this is meant at the time to replicate the human mind and how our neurons are connected to many other neurons through a series of, of connections. But to do this, they needed to devise a way of, of actually building the thing, because it's not trivial to connect one processor to a thousand others and vice versa. And what they, what they settled on for a first machine was uh, the CM1 and CM2s had 65,000 one-bit processors that could simultaneously perform calculations, and they all were connected to 12 others. So the chip design consisted of 16 processors that fit onto a single chip, and they needed to produce 4,000 of those. So Feynman's job was to come up with a way for these processors to connect efficiently, and basically routing tables for how, to, how does this processor talk to that processor and vice versa. And what they came up with, this is going back now to the t-shirt, was these multi-dimensional hypercubes. So if you imagine each end of a line, each circle on that diagram is one of these one-bit processors, and the line between them are how they connect. This is how the architecture was devised. You take two processors, connect them with one line. And then you take two of those, and you connect them with two lines. And you take two of those and connect them with four lines, and so on. So you produce your three-dimensional cube structure. Now take that cube and make a line with another cube. Okay, so we're going to do this, uh, this notation, this symbolic representation, where each corner of the cube is connected to each corner of the other cube, and we just draw that as a line between two cubes. Okay, so we've got now a line with two cubes at the end. Take two of those. You create four cubes connected in a square. Take two of those. You create. Uh, two squares connected uh, to four, uh, with four connection points to the other. So now you have a cube of cubes, a six-dimensional cube. And you take those, and you use them as corners on a higher dimensional cube. So now we're into nine dimensions. So these are all representing the, the geometry of the actual processors and how they connect with one another. Now take that 
and use it as a corner of a bigger cube. And finally, you reach the number of processors and the number of connections necessary to build this computer architecture. So this is the connecting machines architecture. And it was represented in this famous drawing that appeared on Richard Feynman's t-shirt. And that's what the computer itself looked like. Now, in popular culture, Feynman was, was part of Apple's Think Different campaign in 1998, long after Feynman was dead. But he was wearing this shirt. And uh, this is the Think Different campaign. So the shirt itself is, is describing the 12-dimensional architecture. And the, the drawings inside the cubes represent software that's running on this computer. So in use, Feynman actually developed a demonstration program that would run a quantum chromodynamic simulation. And he, he simulated it by hand. So this is what will happen if this processor says this to that processor and blah, blah, blah. And he showed that the CM1 would actually be faster than the machines at Caltech to do this. So this is one of the first programs that were one of the first demonstrations that they, they had. In fact, in 1985, the first program was run, and it was Conway's Game of Life. So that's um, that cellular automata grid of dark and light squares that evolves depending on the geometry. And you may recognize Stephen Wolfram's name, the creator of uh, Mathematica. But he demonstrated a program that could calculate turbulent flow. So this kind of computer is really ideal for that kind of uh, self-updating volumetric modeling or two-dimensional. So if you've got you know, self-interacting fluids, you can use this machine to, um, to calculate that. Now, in popular culture, we find this machine in the background of Dennis Nedry's workspace in Jurassic Park. This is actually the CM3, I think, that they show there. But the, he actually mentions it by name. You know anybody who can network eight connection machines and debug two million lines of code for what I bid for this job? Because if you can, I'd like to see him try. Famous line from Jurassic Park, and in the background, and in a lot of the imagery are the red dots representing the computations happening. So um, presumably in Jurassic Park, this was the gene sequencing computer. But I don't know why you'd need um, a massively parallel computer like this to do it. In fact, in the book, they're using a Cray supercomputer. So in the movie, they switched over to something that was a little flashier, the, the connection machine. But now let's, let's go from where we were and where Feynman was to where we want to be. There's still plenty of room at the bottom. Okay? We have not reached the limits. We're not even close to the limits. And just to give you an example, in 1995, there was a project by students at the University of Pennsylvania to replicate the ENIAC machine on a silicon chip. And they managed to do it on a chip that was 7.4 by 5.2 millimeters on a side. So if you take the original footprint of the ENIAC machine that I told you about and you put it on something that's, that would quite easily fit on your fingernail, you're talking about a 4 million times size reduction. So the techniques that they were using in 1995 to do this weren't actually cutting edge. And if you compare that now to 20 years later today, we can do even better than this. So this is just one example of how small we can actually make things. So if we look now at uh, the picture that Feynman had put up and compare that to, uh, say, the Samsung A7 chip that's in many modern smartphones, uh, they were talking about 20,000 20, times reduced. They're talking about, uh, I'm guessing here, but they're talking about transistor sizes that range from 5 to 500 microns. And we've actually gotten to the point now where we're looking at in, in most modern cell phones, 28 nanometer transistors. So 1,000 times smaller than what was available in the 1980s. And the roadmap by Intel says that we'll be down to the 10 nanometer gate size by the year 2020. So in five years' time, we're going to be um, just about a third of what we were uh, a couple years ago. So now I want to talk about someone who actually works at NINT. And interestingly enough, so Dr. Bob Wolko um, is over at NINT was born in 1958, the year before this uh, famous lecture. Bachelor of Science in 1982, two years before Feynman gave the talk that we saw. And he had a PhD in 1987. And his PhD, basically, in his postdoc work was solving the silicon 110 surface. So if you take a chunk of silicon, a big, nice crystal, perfect crystal, and you cut it along the 100 plane, you have certain patterns of atoms. And it's non-trivial to calculate what that pattern is and what its electrical properties are. But that's what Bob Wolko did. And now he's working at NINT on something incredibly cool. So I'm going to show you a little clip uh, where Bob Wolko was giving a similar lecture on how small can you make things um, that he gave at NINT. So I'll just give you this quote before we start that later on in the video. We won't watch it. But 
With our human hands through a scanning, scanning tunneling microscope, we are not only manipulating atoms, we are manipulating electrons. So this is something that Feynman didn't envision. He was talking about making patches of gold and silver. What we're talking about in the year 2009 is actually not only manipulating individual atoms, which we've achieved, but manipulating the individual electron orbitals on those atoms. This is something that Feynman thought was impossible. He didn't, he didn't know that if you, take, you know, if you take your STM tip and you apply a voltage in a certain way, you can actually remove atoms and leave behind electron orbitals that obey certain rules. So you can actually go smaller than atoms. So just let that sink in for a minute. Feynman was talking about moving patches of atoms. And Bob Woko is talking about watching atoms interact with one another. You think about chemistry as a field, and they're usually mixing you know, beakers and vials, and they're down to the microliter scales if they really want to be small. But they're not doing individual atomic chemical reactions. But here's an example of just such a thing. You can actually watch as a single molecule of styrene comes down, steals a hydrogen, plants itself on the surface, and then prepares a next site for a reaction. And that's what was growing. It was a polystyrene molecule grabbing a hydrogen atom and then growing a chain of polystyrenes on the surface. So they actually watched for the first time a chemical reaction, not in real time, but in basically stop motion. And, and that's, what's, that's what's possible today. And it's possible in the last five years to do it a lot better. So there are labs down in CSIS here where they're doing just such things, but what are they doing with it? And that's what's important. So we'll talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So, oh, I have another video clip coming right up. So we're going to talk next about this atom scale electronics. So you can do this thing, you can make these wires, you can do all sorts of things and change the properties of the silicon surface. So where do we want to go with that? So Bob Oko is also very famous. He has the Guinness World Record for not only the sharpest object that's been made, but uh, that's a, a record that theoretically can't be beaten unless someone uh, comes up with a very clever way of manipulating the electron orbitals on the tip of this. You're looking at the tip of, a, of, a, of an STM. It's a, basically a little metallic filament that comes out. And they're actually sharpening this thing with a very special process that causes atoms to get pulled off the surface. And what you're left with is a single atom at the tip of this thing. So this is an, uh, a field ion microscope, OK? And, and this is how they make tips for their machines these days. They use this field ion microscope. They have a very high field energy. And they leak in some special combination of gases that pull atoms off the tip depending on what the field is in the area around it. So what you have is this tip is eventually just sharpened to a single atomic point. What's interesting is all the shapes that you get going down to that point. And if you stopped at this, stopped this process midway, you could actually get different shapes that might be useful for doing different things. But a single, a single atom is as good as anything. And what you can do with it is illustrated in this video. All right, so that's a very, very simple cartoon of what they're working on today. Now, in that animation, the tables represent that silicon 100 surface, and the electrons sitting at the tables represent those defect states that they pulled off uh, from the hydrogen atom. So when you pull off a hydrogen atom, you leave behind an electron, and that's like the electrons in these table configurations. So what can you do with those? Well, this is where really cool stuff comes in. So as we talked about before, you can make things on the nanoscale by manipulating atoms. Here's an example of a gate. And in the lower left, there's an example of one of these table configurations. You can see that based on the rules that are outlined in that video, if you actually go and you take arrays of those and you make specific patterns, you can make things like circuitry on the nanoscale. And you can make things like adders and logic gates and all sorts of things. You can make every component of a computer just based on this technique. Now, at the moment, the trouble is that it has to be a very pure piece of silicon. You have to have very precise control over which atoms you remove. And then you have to keep it in high vacuum. Because if you leak any gases into this environment, those electronic states are highly reactive. And they'll immediately gobble up whatever's in the, in the vicinity. 
But this is just one example of the directions that we're going. Now, when I was talking about this multi-copter earlier today, I was telling you about the 6050 chip that controls the gyros and accelerometers. Now, this is based on microelectrical mechanical systems that are basically little vibrating disks that are inside of, of these structures. And this is a picture of the gyroscope in the iPhone 4. I'm, I'm looking hard for a more modern um, MEMS device, but despite the fact that I can't, that's just showing you that this is a very robust device and that it's uh, being used all over the place. So not only are we creating electronic devices and scaling them down, but we're also creating mechanical devices and scaling those down. So we're getting into a regime now where we really don't know what's next. We don't know what the next sensor is going to be that's going to be incorporated into your smartphone, right? Um, it could be that the next big sensor technology is something that can smell things in the air. And there are people at Nint that are working on systems to do just that by measuring the weight of molecules that fall onto the sensor. They can tell precisely what that molecule is. Uh, on the other hand, if you're talking about computers, generally speaking, we talk about generalized computers, computers that like our laptops and our smartphones that can do any computation that we throw at them. But what happens if you create a device that can do a specific task? So that's where Bitcoin mining comes in. You guys may have heard about Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency that relies on um, hashing algorithms to um, generate new Bitcoins and transmit them. So just to give you an example, you can do this algorithm, the SHA-256 hash round by hand. But it, it takes a while. Let's say it takes an hour to do one of these um, hashes by hand. When we're talking about devices that do this as that's their only application, they're, they're called ASIC chips, application-specific integrated circuits. We're talking about being able to do billions of hashes per second. And if you just go online and you find a simple Bitcoin miner that plugs into the wall, maybe a 50-watt unit, you can get upwards of 10 giga hashes, 10 billion hashes per second, something that a human would take more than 100 times their lifetime to be able to do by hand can be done in a single second for something that costs less than $50. And that's, so we've talked about MEMS, we've talked about now application-specific computers. What about computers like quantum computers? Last year, D-Wave installed two uh, D-Wave 2 systems with NASA, Google, and Lockheed Martin. And strictly speaking, the D-Wave quantum computing is called an adiabatic quantum computer. So some people think that it's not a true quantum computer. But nonetheless, D-Wave is on track to produce a real quantum computer. And they claim that this is a real quantum computer. But they're on track to, to produce real quantum computers that do computations in a fundamentally different way than, than classical computers do. But when we're talking about these things, um, you know, computer chips, ASICs, MEMS, quantum computers, there's one common feature. Everything we've talked about has been two-dimensional. There are very few examples of what Feynman was saying about putting these devices into the bulk of the material as well. Now, there are examples of people that have tried this. So the Pentium 4 chip, Intel produced a version that had a 3D architecture. Okay, it was a few layers more than, a, than the regular process. And Samsung has a VNAND solid state drive that has a 24 layer structure. So there are companies today now that are exploring uh, these three dimensional structures, but we're just in the very early times. Like this is me, um, what, what Feynman was talking about to, about computer chips in 1984, that's what we're talking about with these three architectures today. So, what are the possibilities? Well, there's lots of people that are talking about designing computers in, bulks, uh, in bulk structures like the diamond structure. So um, the blue atoms here are carbon atoms in the diamond lattice. This is you know, your, your jewelry diamond. Only if you introduce um, a nitrogen atom, you get this um, diamond NV center. And they can actually do some interesting things. So if you shine particular wavelengths of light at them, they'll shine particular wavelengths back. So you can imagine an architecture that consists solely of shining light in to a particular part of this crystal and getting light out of another part, representing a computation that goes through the bulk of the crystal. The trouble is, we're still in the regime where heat is a problem, and we're actually producing this thing in a functional way as a problem. How do you make a diamond layer by layer, right? You're talking about maybe laying a sheet of graphene and plucking some atoms out and putting nitrogens in their place and then taking another sheet of 
of, of graphene and pushing it down on the surface and trying to get it to snap in place. Carbon is pretty satisfied um, in, in the graphene structure. It's, uh, well, let's not say too much about it. I'm not an expert at graphene. But if it was trivial to produce diamonds, then they wouldn't be as expensive as they are, right? So once we get that down pat, we may be seeing more of this, but we still have to solve that heat problem. So just to kind of finalize um, the lecture today, what is the smallest unit of computation that you could do? What is the small, smallest unit of material that you can use towards a computer? And that's a theoretical um, construct that we call computronium. So it's a theoretical arrangement of matter that is optimal uh, for, computing, for computing stuff. So what, is, what are the limits of computation? And what problems could we solve if we had computers that were tiny and ubiquitous like that? So with that, I will invite you to ask questions and uh, leave you with this great quote by Feynman. I never pay attention to anything by experts. I calculate everything myself. So just before, I'll, I'll preempt some questions here. Uh, where we are today in terms of computing is the way I see it before we get to three-dimensional architectures, we're, we're continuing to reduce the size. We're going to run out really soon. Uh, so we're down. Uh, I think the commercial products that you can buy today are still on the 28 nanometer process. They're going down to, to 20 nanometers. And in that predicted future where 10 nanometers is the transistor size, you run into a problem where this is what I study. So my own research is silicon quantum dots. So what happens when you make a silicon domain 5 nanometers and smaller, so between 1 and 5 nanometers? That's where I studied. That's what my PhD is on. And what you get is if you have an electron that's in the conduction band, so this is why it's called a semiconductor. Usually it's in the valence band sitting still. Sometimes if you apply a voltage to it, it will promote it to the conduction band. That electron leaves behind a theoretical construct called a hole, right? There's, there's some vacancy in the valence band and the electrons up here. Now that vacancy actually acts as a positively charged site called a hole. And it has a mass because electrons fill it and then the hole moves. So it has a similar mass to the electrons because the hole, as it propagates through the valence band, is moving electrons out of the way. But because it's negative or positively charged and the electrons negatively charged, they have an orbit called the Bohr magneton. All right? And the size of the Bohr magneton in silicon is about 4.3 nanometers, depending on the temperature. So when you get down to 5 nanometers, you have created a material that is no longer able to support this bound state called an exciton. Basically, it's, a, it's the analog of a hydrogen atom, but it's an electron and a hole. And when you squeeze it further, it's like putting a cat in a box and then making the box really small. The cat gets really mad, so the electron gets really mad, and the energy state available to it actually uh, increase in energy. So you start getting really weird effects when you make silicon really small because the electron has more energy, and it will start emitting light as a means of relaxing itself. So these quantum dots, I could show you a picture, they actually glow. So now imagine you're computing and you're happy and the next generation of computers comes along and instead of doing computations, all they do is emit light. That's the problem that we face by shrinking further. So I don't see that we'll get much smaller than 10 nanometers if we're going to continue just to use silicon. There's not a lot of other options for semiconductors that could be smaller than, than silicon because silicon is already a very tiny atom. But if you say, for example, start using the electron orbitals like Bob Wolko proposes, then you're getting to the point now where you're really at the fundamental limits. So the next step is to produce computers that are reversible, that have such low energy demands that you could run them backwards and forwards by just, by just toggling the voltage. Right now, the way computers work is they're kind of monolithic. You, you do a computation, and you're done the computation. And then you do another computation, and then you're done the computation. But it takes a lot of energy to fix yourself in those states. Right? The next step is to produce chips that draw so little power, such minuscule amounts of power, that you could jump from state to state. And basically, you do a computation through this kind of random walk up and down the processing chain. But nonetheless, you would still be able to do computations. It's that you would draw a millionth of a watt compared to a processor that could draw that draws a watt. So that's the way I see it today. We're going to lower power rather than smaller sizes. And that's going to happen before we get to 3D architectures, because it's a step we need to take so that heat doesn't become a problem and melt all our processors. So pretty much uh, 
like 10 nanometers, you said probably is going to be the limit, at least if we're using silicon, right? The, the conventional limit, let's say the classical limit, because once you go smaller than that, then the physics changes. The physics is on a scale that, that is different. So, so you, can, you can imagine a processor, but yeah. it's not going to be based on what we know with physics. Yeah, yeah. the same physics that we are using okay. for current. So then what difference is that with the quantum computers then? Isn't that technically where we go into quantum computers? Like, what level is that on? Or is it still using silicon at that level, or what? Well, OK, so the quantum computers are a lot more complicated, and I'm not as well versed in them. But the way I understand it is you produce these states in matter called qubits, right? So qubits are these tenuous states. And you can actually use quantum dots as qubits if you put them into particular configured states. Um, now, the way a quantum computer works is through this massively multiplexed method, that if you have a string of qubits representing eight bits and you want to find a solution to a, an eight-bit problem, you prepare these qubits in a superposition of states, and then you pose the problem. And the qubits, by quantum, ooh, I don't want to say magic, through quantum mechanics, produce the answer for you in a very fast way. So there's lots of, um, lots of people that talk about uh, this method, and it's very difficult to get into, but nonetheless, the mathematics works. Uh, so quantum computers, yes, they do represent a different form of computation that is fundamentally smaller, but to prepare these qubits in such a special way requires actually a vast kind of array of, of computa uh, computational elements. So you have to actually prepare the states um, before you can do the computation. So as it is right now, quantum computers are where classical computers back in the ENIAC days. So you, they've got 50 years before they'll mature into their full form. But fundamentally, they're like the connection machine in that the qubits can be entangled among themselves. So the more that you have, the, the bigger the computations. But what kind of things would you calculate with a quantum computer? A lot of people want to do things like molecular simulations, right? How do electrons behave in this atom? How do proteins fold in, in Alzheimer's? How do, uh, you know, a lot of biological applications, actually, because biology is fundamentally very difficult to simulate. So quantum computers may actually be, you know, the machines that we use to design proteins to do specific jobs in the human body um, 10, 15 years from now. Nonetheless, uh, they, they are useful. They're just not useful in the sense that they're classical computers. So the quantum computers wouldn't have, they wouldn't speed up your, your, um, your video games, for example, the way that, that you envision it. Now, it might be that um, they enhance the AI in computers because it's a way of making a decision faster, but that's just speculation at this point. Okay, and what's so special between the difference of 3D and 2D? Like, what makes 3D what we're trying to achieve? So basically, when, when you're doing, I mean, 3D is a way of making, making layers of 2D things. So when, when Richard Feynman was talking about writing the encyclopedia in an area, you know, if you just cut that area into a smaller piece and stack it on top of each other, you can actually make the volume quite small. Volumetrically, that information is the same, right? If you're writing on a single layer of silicon, and you take up a 2D area, it, it's going to be a big thing. And if you cut it into small pieces and stack one another, the area is going to stay the same for the information content, but the footprint is going to be quite a bit smaller. So you can get it in that way. But the, the, the thing that really kind of, in my mind, the reason why 3D is fundamentally different from 2D is because 2D, imagine, imagine a grid on, on graph paper. So you've got a single square surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight neighbors. Now imagine a cube in a volumetric thing and count up how many neighbors it has. So it's got nine on top, nine on the bottom, and then eight around the outside. So what are we, 18 plus eight, 26 neighbors, unless I've butchered that somehow. So you're talking about the difference between having eight neighbors and having 26 neighbors. So it might only be a factor of three different, but each of those cubes has 26 neighbors. So now we're talking about an architecture that's similar to the connection machine only limited because you know you're only talking to the, your nearest neighbors but that being said you know if you if you can do it you know you're you're, you're shrinking your devices even smaller so like just imagine an, an integrated circuit right now it's a little black box that sits on a chip that's two dimensional and the elements within it are actually quite thin i mean the box itself is protecting it from heat and moisture and humidity and and atmosphere and all sorts of other stuff. But 
Nonetheless, you don't have to change the size of the package to add layers in because the layers are so thin. So you're not actually changing the size and shape of these things, but you could be increasing the amount of memory by a factor of 10,000 or the processing power by a factor, again, of say 10,000 in the same package. So it's not necessarily a better way of doing computations. It's just a better way of making it smaller. Yeah. How would you compare a networked array of processors now with the 3D processor that you were describing in this lecture? Well, I think the way that, like, so the way our brain works is, is kind of the, great, the, the best example of like a network computer, right? That uh, we have billions of neurons connected um, with each other by, by thousands and tens of thousands of connections. So when we're talking about you know, 3D architecture, we are talking about limiting those connections by you know, thousands and tens of, tens of thousands to 26 or whatever the number is. Um, so in a sense, we're, we're not going to be competing with brains with these 3D architectures in terms of what we can do. But that being said, we're already getting pretty, pretty good at um, classically out-competing the brain with just standard 2D chips. So I'm only ever, going from 2D to 3D, we're only ever talking about increasing the current classical computer model um, by a factor of three and by, a, by the factor of how many layers you have, right? So the, I think the quantum computer is a better example of, of, a, of a computing device that has that massive networked effect, right? Because if you start with an entangled array of qubits, the more qubits that you add, the more connections that you have with one another. So qubits fundamentally, like the, the entangled state, the starting state of the qubit computation, is kind of like the brain in a sense. Each qubit is connected by every, to every other qubit by entanglement. And the more qubits you add, the more connections you'll have. So in fact, if we talk about replacing every neuron in your brain with a qubit, you can imagine that there'd be more connections, proportionally speaking, because we're not limited by the materials that go between them. We're, we're limited by how they are entangled quantum mechanically. So there's. I don't want to get too deep into the quantum mechanics stuff, <laughs> but, but there's your example. So I, I think that quantum computers will, will be the one that competes with the brain more than 3D architectured classical computers would. But we are getting to the point where you know, your cell phone can beat you at chess, right? So at, at a certain point, we're going to be talking about what other tasks can your phone do um, much faster than you can. But that's a philosophy for, I think there's a, a lecturer that talks about that. Are you, do you still have the Dean of Science? Not this, Not this year? OK. But anyway, it's a topic for a computer scientist, not a material scientist. <laughs> uh, so do you see any kind of, I, I guess as we miniaturize things even more, beyond just you know, I guess improving memory capacity of our computers and making video games run smoother and whatnot, do you see any kind of novel? Uh, discoveries that can be actually applicable to the average consumer because this like while it sounds great it sounds like something that's really restricted to more specialized fields yeah rather than something that you know the average person can use so you know i guess it, compared to the 80s when Feynman was talking the fact that we have laptops that can access the vast majority of human knowledge at the drop of a hat you know using google and the internet and whatnot do you think that i guess miniaturizing and site architecture will ever have a similar effect on humans worldwide, I guess. Yes, yeah, definitely. And I think that's probably the most interesting lesson to learn. So thanks for your question. Um, the way that we're studying materials today is basically, you know, if you replace a single atom in an array of atoms, you change the properties of that group. And when, when we're talking about making computing elements that small, we're saying that if you change one of the computing elements or you change the state of the computing element, you actually change the materials properties of that element itself. So, I mean, we have, you know, we're always talking about like invisible phones and the, the, the text comes up and it's just like a piece of glass. Like that's not far off from what I actually envision in the next 10 years. That eventually you'll get to the point where the actual computing elements of the phone are volumetrically tiny compared to the protective elements of the phone. Like right now, our phone is mostly computers and, and then a little bit of structure. And because we're humans, I mean, you know, when you're talking about 
you know, the rotary dial phones, like the handle. All you needed was the microphone and the speaker, but you still wanted the handle to be able to put it against your ear. So it's not like we're going to throw away um, an object to hold because the computer gets smaller. Now, that being said, you know, you can envision putting something in your ear that speaks to you and in a microphone in your nostril or something that, you know, draws power from the sugar in your blood and connects wirelessly to the speaker and maybe an array of pixels on, on uh, a contact lens or embedded in your cornea or even embedded in the retina of your eye as well. So like all these things, they're not outside the realm of possibility. But what I see being very cool is changing those materials property. So let's say, let's, let's pick, an, pick a material that is, is cool but doesn't have any application. So for example, there are materials that um, have anisotropic heat flow. So if you heat up one end, the heat will flow to the other end, as you'd expect. But if you heat up this end, it will be resisting heat flow in the opposite direction. Now, that's just an example of a, a material that has kind of this anisotropic property of, of um, heat conduction. But what if you could turn that on at the flick of a switch, right? What if, you know, I'm imagining, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we, uh, next week when I do the promise and perils of nanotechnology, that you could change the material properties of things by changing by, by an input from the outside, from a computational input. You could say, like, I want this shirt to be, you know, um, heat conductive so that it cools me off really fast. Or I want it to be an insulator so that it, keep, it keeps me warm in the winter. So now you're talking about a single garment that you could wear in Edmonton that you wouldn't have to put on a thick jacket after, after the lecture. You just walk outside and maybe it just detects the temperature through a temperature sensor and then changes the material properties of the shirt. So, I think that's just scratching the surface of the kind of things you can imagine. Now, because this is technology in the future of medicine, at a certain point you need to ask, when does that get better than our bodies? And in what ways will we be willing to change our bodies to do that? So many people already are starting to wear fitness bands, and it's being embedded in your cell phones as we speak. We don't really know what the ramifications of that kind of knowledge are. I mean, I like to know that I hit 10,000 steps a day, and I feel like gold when I do it, but this is like, this is, this is, the, this is the stone tool of the personal monitoring um, paradigm. Like, we're going to get to the point where every calorie that you put in your mouth is tracked and how much you weigh on the toilet seat is tracked. So you'll know exactly what your inflow and outflow is and how much energy you consumed. And, you know, you'll be able to maybe even change your vision, be able to detect things in IR and UV, right? It'll, we'll be expanding the range of human capabilities one step at a time. So, I don't think anybody can really accurately predict what will happen. And we're in this regime now where you, you know, who wants to buy a cell phone today? I don't because I have the new one. But when the new one comes out, I want the new one because there's always some compelling thing that they've added that, you know, it's marketability. But nonetheless, it's something that they couldn't do the year before, right? That they hadn't been prepared for. And it keeps happening. And it's not like that's going to slow down, you know, like, if you wanted to start your own fab facility today, you'd buy maybe used equipment and you'd be making things. But Intel is so far ahead of you that they're making the next generation for themselves, not for you, for themselves. So with their machines that they currently have, they're making processors that are smaller and faster and, and smarter. And they're making things that they're not selling to you. They're using for themselves to make themselves better. So at a certain point, you have to ask, like, you know, maybe we should be come down on Intel for not sharing knowledge. You know, maybe patents aren't such a great idea because we're going to get to the point where Intel will progress faster than every other country on the planet and will become an, basically an instant monopoly, right? Now, that being said, don't take these as predictions, right? When, when I say a, a single like unitary claim like that, I'm not taking into account everything else that's happening, the whole ecosystem. So Samsung, might see this. They might already be aware of it. They may, they may be doing corporate espionage to, to prevent it. But nonetheless, when I make a claim like that, it's happening in, in a vacuum, right? Where I'm just assuming that the world, doesn't, the world doesn't exist, that Intel only exists, right? So I don't know. I always end these things off on a very confusing note. Like, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. But <laughs> just read some blogs that, are, that, that keep up on this. My favorite blog for um, that kind of consumer electronics side of things is Hackaday. Um, 
you know, the Raspberry Pi that came out yesterday, same price as the one that came out last year, same footprint as the one that came out last year, but four times the computing power. Basically, they put a Snapdragon ARM V7 um, quad-core one gigahertz processor into this thing, and they kept the price the same. This is, this is a $35 computer that they just quadrupled the value without changing the price at all. And there's really no limit to what they're going to do. Well, I mean, there is a limit. But next year, we hope that they're going to do it again, right? So eventually, we're, we're getting down to the point where computers draw very little power. They cost very little. And we don't see computers everywhere. I mean, we see our laptops. We see maybe the flight controller on a quadcopter. But it's not like our chairs are smart. Our chairs don't know if anybody's sitting, sitting in them. It's not, like, it's not like the lights are smart. I mean, we have motion detectors, but that's a single thing. What if the light itself knew more accurately than a motion detector that there was someone there? So I mean, it is this very strange fog that we're looking into, that, that we just can't see what's happening. Uh, because, I mean, for example, that, that stereoscopic camera that was on there, I was researching. and. For the same price, I was finding you know, single cameras, single transmitters, single receivers. And I just happened upon a post that day that said, pre-orders for this new device are available. And it's two cameras, two transmitters, two receivers, stereoscopic vision. Like, There's a confluence here where um, something new gets invented, and then someone decides that that invention is relevant to what they're working on, completely independent. And that's the thing you can't predict. Right? You can't predict what someone will do with a Raspberry Pi that's new and novel. So that's where, you know, that, and that's a single link in the chain. So who knows if they come up with that smell sensor I was talking about at Nint, what is that person going to do with it? Who knows? Right? We can predict as much as we want what technology gets embedded, but what we can't predict are the applications that we see in, in our lives as technology consumers. Is that true that? Quantum dot are promising for cancer detection. Yes. Can you just simply explain? Because I read about that. Uh, it looks really interesting, but uh... in a in a very in a very interesting way. So you know, I see this from the side of of the person who's researched quantum dots, and I don't see them as something special per se. They have special material properties, but the way that you know cancer works is is pretty well known. That you know, cancer cells will have some protein expression. And sometimes they'll have antigens on their surface. The nice thing about quantum dots is that you can basically tailor them to the properties that you want. So for example, if you put, um, now I'm going to get my biology terms screwed up a little bit here, but if I've got an antigen, what, what binds to that? An antibody. So if you've got antibodies on your cancer cells, you can put the antigens on the quantum dots quite readily. Silicon is very carbon um, compatible, so you can put silicon carbon bonds on the surface and then attach whatever you want. So if you know what the antigen is, and that's where that protein um, simulation and synthesis comes in, you can, you can dope the surface of the quantum dot with the antigen. And then it'll flow through the bloodstream as usual, diffuse through cell walls and things like that, and then stick on the surface. Now, depending on what kind of quantum dot that is, you can do some really cool things. So if it's, for example, a silicon quantum dot, there's not a lot you can do with it. You could shine UV light at it and create free radicals um, through removal of hydrogens. But if it's something like a gold nanorod, you can basically put it in a microwave. And because the gold nanorods have accumulated in the cancerous tissue and around the cancerous tissue and presumably not elsewhere, when you microwave the person at the frequency that the, that the nanorods are tuned to, only the tumor heats up. And so you can kill it that way. Or you can create quantum dots that do specific things that are there. So there's this DNA origami idea that you put antigens somewhere in a DNA sequence, and it folds up in a particular cage structure that you maybe put a little um, toxic chemical within right? that will attack the cancer. So this origami protects the body as it's being transported through the bloodstream. And then when the antigen binds, the DNA origami opens up and releases the toxins. So those are a few methods that. Um, are being used to incorporate this kind of miniaturization into um, human biology. How are we doing for time? I guess I got to go. Uh, so for uh, Dr. Wolkow's um, single atom tip, 
Uh, you say the tip is very reactive, and they've been using it from um, in the National Institute of Technology, uh, Nanotechnology here. They've been using it uh, for electron microscopy and things like that. But do you know what um, what kind of things they use to prevent reactions and to make sure that single atom tip um, does the function it's targeted? Do. Yeah, so just to be clear, the reactive sites are the, what, what they're creating on the surface. So the tips are actually quite stable, but when you do have a single atom at the tip, um, you run into the problem where if you just had it out in air and you know an air molecule of nitrogen ran into the tip, you can deform the tip quite easily. So this is the kind of thing that in your giant vacuum system where you have your sample, you'll also have the, the field ion microscope inside the vacuum so that you produce the tip and then you transport the tip over to the sample, and then you do science with the tip. So it's not the kind of thing that we're going to see in, in our daily lives. It's not like you'll you know, be sword fighting with somebody that has a molecularly sharpened tip. Although I'm sure people claim they've sharpened <laughs> knives to atoms, there's always going to be you know, a, an atomic ridge on something that's been sharpened properly. Right? That, that's not to say that it's <laughs> atomically sharp. Right? There's a distinction between sharpness and and there's a distinction to be made about that kind of a thing. But nonetheless, um, could that kind of a thing be useful in a consumer product? Probably yes, but the technique to produce the tip and package it in such a way that it's protected is still difficult. That's, still, that's the kind of thing that um, these integrated circuit companies work on. How do you protect the circuitry inside here so that if someone drops their phone, they don't you know, jiggle up all the single or, or tens of atoms that uh, make up a transistor? So and in that sense, when you consider you know, how many billions of transistors there are in your laptop and the kind of beating it takes just in your backpack on the way home, like you know, moving a few centimeters is not a trivial amount of force for um, small structures like the gyroscopes in our phones. So we do have to wonder about, about that kind of a thing.